Okay, just a couple of procedural notes as we get going on. What's actually going to be our last class session today. Okay, so this is the last time we're actually going to meet together as an entire group. What's going on is I actually have something where I have to go to Las Vegas and make a presentation on Thursday. Okay, not just to have fun. So I will be gone Thursday at class time. The TAs will be around to go ahead and help out. But it's going to be uh, just time for you to work on your projects and hopefully get some stuff finished up. And hopefully you'll have a chance to use that time to your advantage. What will happen is tonight we'll be around for office hours. Tomorrow and Thursday should be some office hours. I'll be back on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, pretty much here most of the day, okay, hanging out in the room. So if you're right down to the end and need some help getting some uh, stuff sorted out, please come in. And we'll like, uh, try and be very available to get you through the final project. Most people who've been plugging away are reporting that, oh, you, you think about like oh, four to five hours on it, something like that. Yeah, not a whole lot more. Because let me just kind of like preface it with, or give you some guidance about just how deep to go with the whole thing. Okay. The idea really of the last project is to give you an experience of taking a model and doing something with it outside of Revit to do some sort of analysis, whether it's to quantify it or do some structural analysis or do some sort of process simulation on it. But it's not necessarily to do a design task. So as you go through and you go off and you do some analysis with it, kind of take it somewhere else and do something to it, um, you know, only go so deep in terms of what you're doing. For example, if you're going through and you are doing the structural analysis, you know, uh, just working through a very high level idea of what the framework's going to look like is enough. The idea is to really go through, just take it out, have the experience of pulling it into E-tabs, do some calculations, and bring it back. No one's ever going to go through and actually check in detail all your calculations and all the members and make sure you got the optimum member size for each of the different like, elements, things like that. We just want to approach it that way. It's more about the experience of going out and bringing it back. In the same sort of sense, if you're doing the estimating task, um, go ahead and what? Everyone's going to be working with different versions of cost books. It's really going to be hard to normalize anything. In fact, I'm going to be quite fascinated to see just how broad a range of estimates we really get for how big, you know, what the initial cost or the conceptual cost of this building may be. But again, no one's going to go through and judge you on the quality of your numbers. It's really more about the experience of going through it and kind of bringing it on back. So it's more the thoroughness of your process as opposed to the absolute number in your results. So go ahead and focus on that side. And as you go through, you know, you get to four hours, five hours, you've had the experience, you've brought it on back, just stop. Submit what you have at that point. But don't feel like you have to go through and do a major redesign of the building. If you're going through and doing the daylighting analysis, mess around with it a little bit if you want to in terms of the windows and how you can try and improve the daylighting in the space. But don't think that you have to go through and do a major redesign of the building because that's just not expected. Okay, so limit yourself because this week you have to. You have to kind of bound things in and make sure things don't get too big because you get a lot, of, a lot of other things that are all competing for your time. So I want to give you that guidance so you don't over deliver on this one. That make sense? Beauty. Okay, let us then go through and just finish up with the last topic we want to cover here, which is actually sort of a very important one. It's the whole notion of model integration. And the idea is that as you're going out and you're working in your Revit world and working on your piece of the world, okay, there are a lot of other pieces that are being developed simultaneously, and not everyone out there is working in Revit. Yeah, the world is very beautiful if you have one model and everything can go into that one model and can be internally resolved amongst the things in that one file. But it, we typically don't have it that way. The reality is every person who's involved in the project probably has their own tool that they're working in and they don't want to change to Revit. Okay, so they wanna, you want to enable them to be able to work in the tool that they're comfortable with, but you still want to get the results of their model back in so you can do some internal coordination and just really make sure that everything resolves, that it's all self-resolving. And that's really what we're all about today. The idea is that we can create models in almost any BIM tool, whether it's Revit or ARCHICAD or Bentley or AutoCAD or you know, Vico, or there's a lot of different tools that we could use to go through and create forms. That's OK. The idea is, though, we need to be able to export those models in compatible formats. And there's a couple of formats that have been really uh, chosen as standards that are sort of good ways of interchanging things. There's NWC, which is Navisworks' own format. There's IFC, the Industry Foundation Classes, DWG. There's about, well, really there's a list of about 20 
kind of interchange model formats that work pretty well. But these are probably your top three in terms of getting information back and forth between the different modeling programs. And the key is, if we can get your model back and forth, it doesn't really matter what program you use to generate that model. We just need to be able to use the data. Okay. Once we've exported the models in a compatible format, the idea is we're going to bring them into some tool that will let us integrate it together. And we're going to look at Navisworks Manage, which is really probably the leading tool for doing this right now, where we'll bring in the models from several different like, uh, disciplines in several different formats. We can align them if we need to. We don't always have our coordinate systems completely aligned, and we need to re resolve all those models so they're in the same XYZ space. Okay. We can save an NWF file. Okay. An NWF file is kind of a really cool concept. It's sort of the equivalent of a PDF file. Okay. What Word documents are to PDF files, okay, Revit documents are to NWF files, in that you can go through and in Revit create the form, change the form, edit the form, but when we put it in an NWF file, it's locked. Okay. It can't be changed. It can't really be opened and edited and have very much happen to it. So NWF is a great format for interchanging models. If I want to give you my model so you can look at it, understand it, query it, but I don't want you to be able to change it or reuse it, okay, then I can give it to you as an NWF. As you're working in industry, you know, people may share models with you as NWF files, and I guarantee next quarter you'll come back to me and say, Oh, I got an NWF file. Isn't there some way I can convert this to a Revit file? And the answer is no. You can't. It's sort of a one-way thing. So if you're getting an NWF file, you may have to go back to the person who gave that to you. If you need the actual models because you want to edit the model, you'll have to ask them for the Revit model. Okay, so watch out for that because that's one very common question we have when agencies share models with you. Finally, we're going to do analyze the composite model. We're going to take a look at that model, and there's a couple of big things we might do. We start by just integrating all the pieces together, because if you have a civil model that was created in civil 3D and a Revit model of the architecture, and someone did oh some uh, an ETABS model of the structure, this is maybe your very first chance to actually get all those model pieces together into a single place and look at them. So we integrate, then we can view and explore, kind of find different things that look interesting in the models. A big classic capability we want to look at is the whole issue of just finding things, marking up the model, and either manually identifying problems or using clash detection to go through and look for things where clash detection is all about the idea that two different elements from either the same model or two different models are occupying the same space. Okay, and that's typically a problem, a very common problem, but often one that you don't figure out to the field. Okay. So nice to be able to go ahead and figure those out in advance. We're going to look at 4D process simulation, how you can go ahead and assign all the different elements in a model to a task timeline. And one of the last things that you can do, which is very important, and I don't want to undersell, is this whole notion of just rendering the model and simulating what's going in the model. And this is kind of this highly undervalued point. We create our models, and we think they're beautiful. But ultimately, you've got to remember your model has a point. You're trying to ultimately sell something to someone. You're going to sell them on your design. You're going to sell them on the process you're proposing. You're using the model as a vehicle for communicating and kind of sharing your ideas. So there's some very powerful tools within Navisworks for either rendering, because although we could do rendering in Revit, we can't render everyone else's model until we get them all together into a single format. And then we can render those other pieces of the model also. Same thing with simulating. We can go through and either make things happen like as you do a walkthrough of the model, you can do walkthroughs, but you can do things like have doors open and close as you go passing through that point. Or you can do things like simulate pieces of construction equipment moving around on site, or even traffic moving across the structure so you could start to see really how traffic's going to flow as that structure continues to change. Okay, so there's a lot of cool things you can do within Navisworks. I'm going to go back and look at some of these again, just ever so briefly, because the point of looking at these is that it wasn't so much that it was just sort of wrong in the drawings, but actually, these are classic things that happen if you have different models that aren't resolved properly. This situation, where we have an architectural model up here at the top of the driveway and a civil model down here on the street, is a classic case of we have two models that weren't really resolved against each other. So, this may have been done in Revit. The street work may have been done in a different program. But because those models weren't really resolved together, you end up with problems like this, where you just have you know, where those two models have to come together. Things don't fit. Another classic problem of where 
The building model may have been A-OK, -okay, whatever was supposed to be happening out here in terms of how the building was going on the site. There was some lack of coordination between those different elements. This one is probably a case of, well, it could be that whoever was designing the escalator systems was a separate subdiscipline, and the way they designed it really wasn't in line with what was going on in the ceiling. But there's clearly some like coordination problem happening there. Okay, this is again that one of those ones where just really the site model and the architectural model didn't get together. So you end up with this expectation of what was going to happen with the site model. Okay but it didn't actually pan out in terms of like where things in the architectural model ended up relative to where the site was. Okay. It's another classic case. This is a case where you probably have several different sub-consultants all working on different fleet models. Whoever was doing the security system probably had one model they were working on. Whoever was doing all the LED panels probably had a different model they were working on. And although those things don't physically clash, okay, that's kind of a clearance clash. Okay, and it'd be nice to know some of those things. But it's quite easy to imagine how things like this happen. If I'm just working on my piece and putting cameras in, and I'm doing just fine, I'm putting it fine relative to the structure, you know, the trick is to know sort of that someone else isn't putting something in into a place that I'm counting on. Okay, again, it's a case where the building model and whatever was happening in the civil model, the street and where that light pole were, just, you know, they didn't get resolved. Okay, and that's really what it's all about today, is really trying to get those different pieces together and understand where those clashes may be. Okay, let's come back over and we'll experience that just by taking a look at Revit and then Navisworks and how they can all work together. And to get started, you can pull it off the L drive if you want to. I have a file. Actually, I'm just going to open the assignment file and I'll show you how we would export that in the common file format. So let me open up Revit Architecture. Is it opening? I don't think it is yet. What I've done in all these machines, so you're welcome to follow along if you want, is we've installed Revit Architecture, or excuse me, Navisworks, on all, almost all these machines. And in terms of making that work, it is on every machine except this one. Well, on yours too. It's not on this one, but that's okay. You're going to follow along for just a minute. You can pick up the file that's going to come out of Revit Architecture in just a second. I didn't quite get it on all the machines. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm going to start out by opening up this little Office Architectural. This file you may recognize as being the file that you're working on for your assignment. Okay, it's our little Revit model. Everything's kind of happening just fine. The idea is the architectural team has designed this as our preliminary design. What we want to do now is go through and export this so that we can use it in the model integrator. And where you'll find the exporting is, there's actually an add-in tab available now since I've installed Navisworks. And under the add-in tab, you will find something which will export to Navisworks 2010. So I can say, super, let's go ahead and do that. This is going to be very much, it's like exporting a DWF file. It's just another file format we can take things out in. And there are some options we can use to customize that. But for the most part, I just sort of leave it alone. Actually, I think I just lost it there because I clicked out of the window. Let me find it again. There it is. Okay, let me go through, and I'm just going to give it a name. I'm going to call it, oh, let me go ahead and just call it Office Architectural Export 2. And I'm going to save that away. What it's going to do is, since I was in the 3D view and I had the whole model visible, it's going to export all 1,397 objects. So it's very much like creating that DWFX file. It's just another uh, yeah, take on exporting the whole model. Let's see what that actually does for us. I'll come back out and, oh, actually, let me do the same thing from the other side before I go into Navisworks. Let me say that, hey, not only did our architectural consultant go through and work on it, our structural consultant was busy too. So let me go ahead and open up Revit Structure. So here we are in Revit Structure. Come on, oh, finish open up. There it is. Let me open again. You'll find this on the L drive if you want to in session 19. Office Structural. A 
and let's let it open on up. And what this file is all about is our team of subconsultants has gone ahead and worked on this. Okay, that's sort of an idea of the uh, basic columns, beams, some joists to kind of support some things. But we have a separate little structural file there. Just so you know, this was actually created by linking the architectural model. I can do that. And then let me just kind of show you how it all fits together. Let me go to the uh, visibility graphics. You'll see I have a linked model. I can turn that back on. Oops. Or is it not showing? I got the floor showing. Oh, I know what it is. In my linked model, in terms of how the settings are in all the visibility graphics. Let me take a look down in there. Da, 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 da. Model categories. I just have most of those things turned on. Let me show them all. Actually, let me even do this. Let me say all. That'll be fine. But let me go ahead and uh, make them sort of transparent so you can sort of see through them. Let's see if that'll work. No, you don't hardly see very much that way. Okay. I'll get out of that in just a second. I'll say do that, Revit links, I'll turn them all on. Let me not make them transparent. Oh, I know what I'm doing. I'm sort of messing up in there. Jeez. No, I am actually doing the right thing. Jeez Louise. OK. Should be on. No, ignore that fumbling around. Trust me, these two models are actually sort of linked together, although I'm not going to waste your time kind of watching me fumble through and getting the show back up again. It's through that linking in the visibility of graphics, we'll get them back. But we'll get them back. Don't worry about that. OK, what I'm going to do is I'll just turn that off again so it's not bothering me. OK, got the linked model. I'm going to do the same thing that I did over in the other program. I'll say external tools. And I'll say Navisworks 2010. And I can then save this out as Office Structural. So that is, I've created my model, you've created your model, we've got all these different models that are all sort of coming together. There are some other formats we might have used. If you didn't want to use NWC, we could have instead said Export. Could have created an IFC file. Okay which will then use the industry foundation classes to go ahead and, ex again, export a standard file. We could use DWG. There's a lot of ways we could have done that. But since we know that we're going to go to Navisworks, NWC is a good format because it understands the relationship and how things should be mapped really well. Let me just cancel that. Okay, I am done working in structure and architecture for right now. I'll say no thank you. I don't care to save. Let's close that one up. And we are ready to try pulling all this stuff together. How we do that is we're going to go to opening Navisworks Manage. And you're going to have to open 2010. I'm opening 2011 just because I have a little licensing issue in terms of being able to access the way I installed it on this machine. So I'm going to go with 2011 instead because I have its own separate copy of that. Let me say OK. But for you, go ahead and open up Navisworks Manage 2010. It should be under the Start menu. And it'll come up. It'll look very similar. The ribbon at the top is a little bit different. You're going to have a menu bar at the top. But it's going to look very similar.
Okay, before we go much further, let me close a lot of this stuff up because, oh, there are so many different windows, it's really easy to get confused. Okay, we'll start with just a fairly clean space. This is our like drawing area. You'll see little view cubes up here. We have this little guy of our navigation tools available, little home button, some things that are looking sort of familiar. And it's all going to start just by opening one of our existing files. So I can say, under the application menu, or if you're at the file menu, say open. Let's go on out to wherever you have stored those things. Again, if you haven't stored them somewhere, you're welcome to go to the L drive and find them there. What I'm going to do is actually go to the open dialog and I'll pull on down. Notice that by default it's set to NWF. That's that like PDF like format. That's not what I want to open here. I'm going to open an NWC file, which is the interchange format. So I'm going to choose all Navisworks files so I can see them. It's kind of like the same problem we have in Ecotext, where the GBXML didn't show up in the list until you change the file filter. Then I can say, let me bring in that architectural export. What's difference between Navisworks and Manage and Manage is a big proprietary tool that you pay a lot of money to do this for. Actually, you don't because you get the student license. Freedom is like the lightweight freebie given to anybody. As far as I know, that's the primary difference. So it's kind of like Acrobat writer versus uh, reader, something like that. Okay. So here we are. We have our architectural model. It's hanging out there. It's looking OK. You can navigate around it a little bit if you want to. You know, you're doing your orbiting. In fact, in a lot of ways, this looks very much like a, oh, what is it? This looks very much like d uh, design review, because it is. It really is the same fundamental engine under there. Let me kind of show you something when I'm orbiting. Notice the pivot point's kind of in a weird space for my orbiting. Let me just go ahead and move that. I can use this oh, center, and then I can just sort of move the pivot point to kind of like the center of the building, which will then just make my orbits a little bit easier, because okay, the orbit was just a little bit odd about what was going on. Again, let me show you what I did there. If I move the center, over here out to the edge of the building there. Then when I orbit, everything's around the edge. Okay. Whereas if I move the center back towards the hub or you know, like the skylights, then we'll just rotate around the center. That's all that's going on there. Another thing we might want to do now, let me go through and I'm going to open up a different window. I'll go to the View tab and say that I want to open up the Selection Tree window. Let's see what's going on here. We have our model kind of hanging over here. We can open that up, and you'll see it's broken into all the elements on the different levels. Let me change from compact to standard. Standard will let me kind of keep on expanding. And there's actually all these different little individual elements. This is very similar to quantity takeoff. All the little elements are kind of hanging around in there. And if you choose the elements, you can go choosing individual pieces. As you choose them, they'll highlight in the model. Let's go ahead and see if I can figure out how to make that work for us. Find some things that are on the front of the model. OK, there are some pieces. There's, uh, there's the storefront. There's some pieces of glazing. As I'm moving different, no, uh, choosing different things, notice what's happening over here. Let me zoom on in over here a little bit so you can see better. As I'm moving around, we're just getting the different elements in there. So that's the entire storefront. That's the piece of glazing. We probably can't see it, but that's the mullion. That's the second piece of glazing. Third, fourth, fifth, that's the sixth, all that. Okay, so we got all these different little pieces. So the whole model is kind of hanging around in here. Now, you may want to see the entire model just like this, or you may want to go through and hide some different things. For example, if I want to go through and hide some of this glazing, I can choose some different items in the tree, and I can right click and say hide them. Okay, and, and that'll just knock them out. Okay, or I can put them all back in there. Maybe it'd be better to actually kind of hide the entire storefront. Let me hide that. And it doesn't look like it's hiding. Hmm. 
Looks like they're there, but not doing a very good job of hiding. Let me try something a little bit different. Let me go ahead and just hide the entire first floor. There we go. So we're looking at the building and the stairs going and up through it. Can I just, you're just right clicking on that yes. And what I'm doing is I'm just right clicking and then I can get to hide. Or unhide them to bring them on back. That's an interesting one. Let's take a look. So when you right click on it, there's no hide? Hmm. And take a look at where you are for a second. Got it? Okay. Oh, it's under a little bit different for you? Let's take a look. Yes. Yes. Because they've just sort of changed the terminology around a little bit. That's okay. Hidden versus hide. Just enough to confuse things. Okay. Let's go ahead. We have this one model in there. Let me gonna pop on out here a little bit. Let me uh, zoom on out. I can push up or push down to zoom. Okay. So we brought that one model in there. Another thing we can do to that model just to help us sort of see inside of it a little bit is under the view point, we can change it around. We can turn on something called sectioning. It's like the 3D section box. Remember that thing? So if we turn on sectioning, we get this funny little widget here, and I can now pull up or down and sort of see inside the model. I can sort of move around my viewpoint a little bit. I can kind of slice it the way I want. So by using a combination of orbiting and slicing, we can usually come up with a pretty good view to show exactly what we want to see. I'm trying to get out of that tool. Go back to my little widget here. There we go. Kind of bring it up or down. Okay, now, one model is kind of cool. Let's go ahead and bring in the second model so that we can see it all acting together. Okay. And how we're going to do that is, once you already have one model in there, we can go to home and say, append a second model. And the idea is you're just going to keep on appending as many different models as you want to. So for the second model, I'm going to actually bring in the structural model. For your third model, you might go ahead and bring in the site model. For your fourth model, you might bring in some uh, sort of utilities. You can bring all these different models in together and kind of get them in one place. Now you might notice as we bring it on in there that my models don't exactly resolve right now. They're a little bit off from each other. Okay. So one thing that's very important to do after you bring your model in is just get the x, y, z coordinates kind of in alignment with each other. So let's talk about how you can do that. It's really, there's two ways we could approach it. We could try to do it graphically just using the move tool, or we can try and go through and do this just by putting coordinates in there, kind of whatever is going to work for you. Let me show you the coordinate way first, because that's sort of very precise. Then I'll show you the move way. Okay. The coordinate way looks as follows. You'll see over here I actually have two different models in my tree. That's the whole structural model. And if I go zip it around in the model, I can actually go choosing different things. I can choose different beams. Go ahead and I'll just bring some of these beam systems. Okay, there's the beam system that's up there on the second and third floor. Okay, I can choose these individual guys here. Okay. One thing I can do though about the entire model is I could choose the model at the highest level and I can right click and you'll find something called units and transform. Transforming is this whole thing we could rotate the whole model. For example, if we knew that we got a model and it really was like 90 degrees off, we could just rotate it that way. If we knew that it came through just at a different scale, for example, let me put that back, that someone did it, but they're using metric, we're using English, and somehow the units didn't come across, we could apply different scaling factors in the XYZ direction. Okay? Or what we're going to do is just do a little transform. We're just going to move it over. Okay, so in terms of transforming it, let me get it rotated back first. That's the starting point. If I come to the top view, 
you can actually get a pretty good sense of how far off we are, and I know how far off it is. It's around, oh, it's like 22 or 21 and a half feet this way. It's about 20, it needs to drop, it needs to go that way about like 20 and a half feet. It's off by a little. And it's really just an issue of we have two different coordinate systems at work. Now to combat this, what you often do is in your model, you'll put some little datum point that everyone could have in their model at the same place. That way when you bring them all together, you can just put one datum on top of another, on top of another, and that way it gets all resolved. But I didn't do that when I constructed this model. So we'll fix it up after the fact. What I'm going to do is take that model, the structural model, could do it the other way, but I'll do it to the structural model. And I'm just going to move it over, I think it's about 21 and a half. Again, I happen to know that number because I was playing, but I'll show you how we can sort of do this graphically in a second. So I shove it over to the right a little bit. Okay, and then I'm going to go ahead and I will push it down a little bit. And I think that was, oh, it's like minus 20 and a half, something like that. Okay, and I think that's actually it. Okay, now I happen to know where that is, so that worked out pretty well. Let's go ahead and show you a different way. But you know, we need to get it over there. If you want to check the alignment, what is good to do is go through. Oh, let me go to a different kind of zoom. I'll go zoom window, which is the one I like that's like zooming to a region. Actually, I still think it's a little bit off. Let me go through and I'll do that uh, sectioning again. Let me switch again to a different view. Oh, we're looking pretty good there. Let me zoom in over the top view again. Actually, I should comment as we're working. These viewpoints that we're working on, we have this whole issue of there's a couple things. We're sort of a style, a lighting style to them. There's used all the time. There's sort of the lighting mode. Full lights versus headlights. It sort of has to do with how shadows are cast based on whether there's like a light on your head, kind of like you're walking through a tunnel or something like that, versus having light on everything. You also have the mode of whether it's rendered, shaded, or wireframed. Okay, that'd be a completely wireframe view. This will be more of a hidden line mode. Okay, let's go ahead and like uh, take a look and see if we can figure this out. Let me zoom in a little closer. We're doing pretty good, except for the fact, can you see that everything's projected in, it's like a parallel projection right now. Okay. That makes it a little bit hard to work, because when everything's in parallel projection, you, know, you can sort of see where the cut lines are, that that's off by a little bit. But that's a little bit hard to sort of understand for some people. So what I'm going to recommend is instead of perspective, you actually switch over to orthographic, which will just make it uh, everything projected 90 degrees. Okay, now you're looking good. Zoom on out. Okay. You can see our problem is here's the column and all the beams coming together. There is as follows. Let me zoom on out. Okay. I am going to choose that and I'm going to go to the item tools. And the item that I'm going to try and use is the move tool. And this always gives me some hassles, so. Forgive me if it doesn't work, but we'll try it. I'll say move. When I say move, this funny little widget shows up. It's right over here. It's got a green, a yellow, and a red, and a little box right there. If I grab it inside the box in 3D Studio Max, it's this funny little widget thing. If I get inside there, I get a hand, and now I can start moving things around. Now it's in there. If you want to see what that actually did, you could even come back over here to the transform and see it is. It's 21 and a half minus 20 and a half. It's actually in place now. That's the way it needs to resolve. But just be aware of that. You need to, when you bring models together, you may need to move them around a little bit just to get the X, Y, Z in the same place. Looks good? Okay. Let me pop on out again to the home view. And take a look. Okay, I'm going to switch it back to uh, one of the other views, like the. Sh oh, what do I want it to be? Uh, it's looking a little too naked right there. I'll go back to shaded. 
Okay, so we still got the section plane on. That's what that's all about. Okay, and we have things moving back in there together. Now, as you're going through and working, the, the downside of having all this information in the same model is it gets really, really loaded in there. There's a lot of information on the screen. So you sort of get to this issue of how do you control what are you looking at on the screen at any time? And there's two issues I want you to think about. One is, where is your camera? You know, where are you looking from? And the other is, what information is visible right now? Okay? The issue of where the camera is, we're going to handle with something called a viewpoint. We can set different viewpoints with just different camera locations. Okay? And after we set a viewpoint, we can navigate around really quickly between those things. So let's start with that. Let's go through, and I can, for example, decide that, oh, let me orbit a little bit. I can decide that this is a view I like. And if I like that view, what I can do is say, save a viewpoint. And it will go through and create a viewpoint for me. What is this? This is kind of the northeast corner. Okay. Let me go ahead and rotate to a different viewpoint. I'll come over to that side. Okay. If I like that viewpoint, I can save that viewpoint. And I'll call it, that's the northwest corner. Now, it's not just rotation. Let me orbit around a little bit. And if what I'm really trying to do is understand what's going on sort of in that plumbing area where the bathrooms are and the elevator core, I can zoom in over here. You can see all my little toilets and things kind of hanging around in there. Let me do it with this. I will zoom out. So if this is my area of interest here, what I'm again going to do is go through and save a viewpoint. And this is going to be kind of the bathroom core. Now the nice thing about these viewpoints is they're really just convenient locations for you to get back. If you go clicking on one or another, it'll just rotate you through the different viewpoints. Okay, so go ahead. That's just putting different cameras in place so you can go through and move things around. So create as many different viewpoints as you need. The viewpoints are going to become critical to you as you keep on working, because you always want to get to a place where you can see what you're after. Okay. And in each of those different views, we can go ahead and adjust what it is we want to see. Oops. I'm transforming the model. That's not what I wanted to do. I still have that thing turned on. Okay, let me go back to the northeast corner again, northwest corner. Okay, we're doing pretty good. We have these things sort of set up in terms of looking at the different viewpoints. Okay, the next thing we want to control is actually what it is that we're looking at. And how you can do that is, again, over here, in this view, we can find things in the tree. Okay, and we can either turn them off in here. If we can go through and find them. Where am I? I'm actually on the second floor. Or let me try something else here. If I come into the model and choose that toilet or choose that sink, notice it actually show me where it is in the model tree. So here I am. I chose the toilet. I chose the sink. I can go through here and choose the door. I can choose the uh, stairway. And as I do that, it'll show me where things are in the tree. See how that's working out? Okay, once I go through and sort of find something and I know what its name is, I can do a couple different things. I can do a quick find. Let's see if that'll do it. Well, that's not going to be very useful in terms of, it's good for some things. For example, let me find the slab. Okay. I actually have the slab there. You can't see it from this viewpoint. Let me go ahead and switch over there. There it is. You can sort of see it down at the bottom. So I can do some searching. It's interesting. It goes down the tree, then goes up again. Let's try something else. Let me call the core. We'll find that, but it only finds one. Let me try here. If I keep on clicking, it'll go through and find one after another. But that, again, is not a very efficient way of doing it. Let's try something different. 
What if we want to get all the things that are the core walls or all the things that are glazing or something like that? How we do that is we come up here and we say find items. And we get this funny little window which is all about just searching. Okay? And what we can do is choose which model we want to look in. I'll go ahead and look in the architectural model. Then I get to choose and specify some criteria. I'm going to look for the items whose name, not creator, let me get back to name, going to contain, I don't want to actually put the equal in there. The equal is almost a little bit too precise. I want to be a little bit loose about this. So I'll say it's going to contain like glaze or glazing. I'm going to turn off matching case. That'll be a little bit looser. And I'll say find all. And can you see what it's done? It's actually in the window or in the model there. It's gone ahead and grabbed everything that has the name glazing. It didn't get the doors. They must have a slightly different name. It didn't get those windows. They must have a slightly different name. But I can go through and grab all those things. So here's the idea. Once you've selected something that you're interested in, boy, it sure would be nice to save that away because I hate having to go back and remember all these criteria again and again and again. You really want to start building up kind of a library of just your favorite selections. And how you do that is as follows. If you come on over, actually what I have to do is open up something called the Sets window. I'll go to View. I'll say Sets. We'll bring up yet another window. It's a lot of windows and tabs in here. Notice we have an empty collection of sets right now. What we want to do is actually add the current selection to the set. And how you do that is you right click in there and you say add the current selection. And I'll just call this glazing all floors. Okay. If we ever want to get that back again, we just have to click on that set and it'll select it. Let's try something a little bit different. Let's try something, oh, what if we got all of, for example, let's see if we can get all the toilets. I'll say find all. Oops, name is empty. Contains toilet. Find all. Hang on, I have an extra little guy over here. I have to get rid of this one. I'm going to right click that and say delete that condition. What is its problem? Something doesn't contain toilet? I thought it did. Let's see if we can find that out again. Actually, what I can do is go back to the bathroom core and select it. We'll figure out what it is. Let me go back and sort of see what's going on here. OK, I got a toilet right there. Let's find it. Oh, it just doesn't have the word toilet. It has seat height in there. OK, no worries. I can say seat, say find all those. It'll grab all the different toilets and super. Now I can go through and save those away in my sets. I'll click to the tab. I'll say add to the current selection. I'll call it toilets all floors. The idea is you go through and you kind of keep on adding these different items and making these different selections. Once you've gone through and created these selections, you can do different things. For example, let me switch back out to the other viewpoint. I'll go back to the glazing. Go back to sets. Choose all the glazing right there. Let's zoom on in there. That looks like I moved all my glazing, which we don't want to do. Let me undo that. I've got to turn off move mode. Move mode's not doing me any good. Okay, And what I can do, having selected those, I can, for example, hide all those. Okay, Or bring them back again. I can choose where I want to search. And I'm going to search. They're actually in the structural model. I'm going to describe them by saying that I want to get all the items whose name, not creator, 
and I'll say contains, you can either pull down and sort of go looking for them in the list. There's 12K5 right there is one of the choices. When I say find all, it'll actually grab every one of them. Okay. And what I'm going to do then is say that, OK, let me add these to the current selection, or add the current selection. And I'll call that, these are the uh, bar joists all floors. Let's see, figure it. I think it's kind of hanging around on the side. It's the selection sets. Yeah, and go ahead and pin that in place. Okay, so what you're going to do is, now that you have some things selected, right click down in here and say add current selection. Beautiful, and then give it a name. Okay, so the game is really to go through and define different criteria, define different sort of search criteria that will find these different things so that you can kind of keep on creating the sets. Let me kind of show you a slight variation on the scheme. I can go ahead and say add the current selection. I can say add the current search. Let's talk about what the difference is going to be. If you add the current selection, later on when I come on back to this, if the model has changed, the selection will contain all the same elements that I put in that set, but it wouldn't contain any new ones that might have been added that would also sort of meet that criteria. Okay, because it's sort of locked those elements. If I instead say bar joist search and sort of save it that it has the little uh, kind of oh, binoculars in there, that's actually defined as a criteria that will be dynamic. And that's actually a very useful thing because later on when we come on back, if the models change, some new windows, some new doors, whatever got added, okay, it'll go through and find the new selection as opposed to sort of what was locked in at the time. So just kind of think about whether you sort of want to lock a selection or you really want it to be a dynamic selection. But what we're doing, or why we're actually sort of trying to go through and like get all these different items and sets, is that's going to come in very useful for us for our next thing. The idea is you create viewpoints. We go through and kind of add, categorize our objects and put them into sets so we can access them easily. And then using those sets, that's how we're actually going to go through and create our timeline. Because what we're going to do is go through and create sets representing all the different things that belong in each of the different tasks. Okay, then map those individual tasks into the simulation that way. Okay, so that sort of makes sense. Go ahead and let's break right here. Come on back in five minutes and we'll continue this exciting exploration of Navisworks and like uh, show you how to go through and make that 4D timeline because you have all the essentials. We just have to sort of knit all the pieces together now.